pleasure to have a guy named Salak who's going to tell us about shifted symplectic protection. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so the talk today will be about shifted symplectic production. Uh, there will be things uh, that will be similar to what Henrik had talked about yesterday, but uh, with a very different language and from a different perspective. Uh, my motivation, so let me start with some motivation. My own motivation to work on this was to understand some, some features of the classical BV formalism. Um, and understand some aspect of it. So uh, let me start with a, like a very simple situation. We have uh, x. Uh, so I mostly do algebraic geometry nowadays. So I'll, I'll use the language of algebraic geometry. But when I, whenever I say algebraic, smooth algebraic variety, you can think of uh, like smooth manifold. That's that's perfectly fine. Uh, we start with a with a variety x with a function on it. So Whenever I write A1, think about R, and that's, that's fine. Uh, and assume that there's a, there's a, a symmetry, like infinitesimal symmetry. So there's a Lie algebra G uh, that acts on X, and that leaves F invariant. So we have a, a, a Lie algebra uh, map from G to vector fields. And whenever I evaluate df on the image of these vector fields, that's, uh, uh, that gives zero. OK. And um, so like if, let's say, let's say we would have local coordinates x1, xn. These are coordinates. Uh, I don't know. Maybe physicists would, would call them uh, field variables. Uh, the, like the, the classical BV formalism, like we're the following way. So you add a bunch of fields uh, successively. So the first field you would add would be, um, let's, let's say, um, uh, like one y1 to yk. So these are elements living in the dual of the Lie algebra. These account for like uh, uh, infinitesimal symmetries. So like I think mathematicians usually call them Chevalier generators. And then, once you've done this, so it amounts to, like, in like people who like stack would say that these are functions, uh, like functions depending on those variables. These are functions on the quotient stack from by of x by little g. And then you add new fields, and usually these new fields, you have as many fields as you as many fields as you have like here. So you have you add like xi one xi m. Let me call them anti-field variables. And then uh, we also add dual variables from the y, so eta1 to eta k. Uh, so these Chevalier generators, I think physicists call them ghosts. So that would be anti-ghosts. Um, I don't know, maybe not. OK, uh, so these are anti-fields of ghosts, right? OK. All right, so uh, these guys have degree 0, these guys have degree 1, these guys, the size have degree minus 1, and those ones have degree minus 2. And you see that there's a pairing between the x and the xi and the y and the etas, and this pairing has degree minus 1. Uh, so this is, the, the, like, this is a reminiscence of the fact that there's a minus 1 shifted symplectic structure somewhere. And this minus one shifted symplectic structure is on the following gadget. So since f is invariant, f descends to a function on x mod g. Uh, so we have a function f bar that lives on x mod g. And what we've computed here, I mean, the algebra generated by this, is the algebra function on the derived critical locus of, of, of that function here. So what we've computed is the derived critical locus of this f bar here. OK. Now that there's another construction that does ex like exactly the same thing, but if in a different order that, was, uh, that I found in, in references where mathematicians started to try to understand the BV formalism. So for instance, if you read Stashev's uh, 
paper, which is like the secret homological algebra behind the BD formalism, or if you read the more recent paper by uh, Felder and Kajdan, they have a different way of introducing those things. Uh, they first, so I, I'm not going to write again the same thing, but they first introduce anti-fields uh, that they call causal generators. Uh, then they introduce that, that's a bit weird if you think about it, anti-fields for ghosts before introducing ghosts. That's what they call Tate generators. And only after that, uh, they do the following thing. So they introduce the, 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 the symmetry generators. That's a bit weird. And uh, I wanted to understand what's the meaning behind this. And if you think about what they are doing here, it looks a bit like symplectic reduction. Because what they are doing first, they're introducing this, this anti-fields here. So they are computing the derived critical locus of F. Then they introduce new generators there, which are also some kind of generators when you take a fiber product and then you do it uh, in a homological way. So that's taking the zeros of some moment map. We'll see that later. And after that, they take uh, quotient by symmetries. So, they, so somehow the upshot of the whole talk is that this first guy here is a symplectic reduction of this second guy here. And that's essentially the like the, the main content of the talk will be to, to show you that these two ways of computing the same thing is exactly saying what I've, what I've just said. Yeah? This is true. So what I'm saying works in the case when you have a algebra of symmetries and it acts on the whole of X. Uh, it is true that like what they're doing is very well suited for the case you, you're, you're, you're talking about. Yes. All right, so um, also another thing I want to do is to replace a little g by a group g. That's what I'm going to do in the talk. So we will have like a global symmetries instead of having infinitesimal symmetries. Um, and that will also be an excuse to introduce some shifted symplectic stuff. All right. So let me start with uh, some recap of uh, uh, about shifted symplectic structures. So, uh, so let's say we have some nice uh, geometry gadget. So the, the technical term is a derived uh, arts in stack. So it's an object that can be attained in the following way. So you glue together derived schemes. So these are like uh, the basic object of derived algebraic geometry. And you allow yourself to take successive quotient by nice enough groupoids in the category. Um, so these are objects which are like very pathological from like a geometry point of view, but still they have a tangent complex. They have a lot of features that allow you, so, you to, to deal with them in a geometric way. Um, so whenever we have a, such an object, there's a, we can construct the Durham algebra. So the Durham algebra is like global sections of uh, symmetric powers of the cotangent complex that we shift, for which we shift the degree. And this object has a lot of structure. Uh, first of all, it has two, uh, two degrees uh, or two gradings. There's first the uh, homological or cohomological grading. Uh, it just comes from the fact that Lx, the cotangent complex, is a complex. Ox is a DG algebra. So when we, like, when any construction we do has an internal differential that, that's built in. So this, this one is called the degree. And there's a second grading. So it, it goes along with a, with a differential that I will write d int for the internal differential that has degree plus one. And then there's, a, there's the weight. That's just the... 
uh, that's just the symmetric degree here. All right? And uh, it comes with uh, uh, another differential that commutes with the first one. It's the Durham differential. And this Durham differential, it has uh, weights, uh, sorry, degree one and weight one, while the internal differential has degree one but weight zero. It preserves the weight, right? Okay, so it's like what we're having here is almost like a double complex, except that the, like the convention or like or a bit shifted, okay? So. Uh, Yeah, there's a question. Oh, because uh, like typically Durham goes to from OX to LX. So it goes from O to the to Keller differential, let's say. But uh, because there's a minus one shift, you have to shift back by one here. It's because like we've shifted there. So it's just so that it's made so that this guy is actually an exterior algebra whenever this sits in degree zero. Okay. Uh, you, you could take different convention that would make this a bicomplex. Uh, for some reason, we like people decided to do this that way. I think if you read Pridham's paper, he uses bicomplexes instead of uh, like, that's called a graded mixed complex. The, the category of graded mixed complex and bicomplex are equivalent actually. Okay, so, and um, N shifted uh, symplectic structure on X. It's uh, well because of this. It's a it's a two plus N cocycle in the following complex. So let me write it and then. Uh, so it's this complex is the following thing. So. Um, So it's just the, the product for all k greater or equal to two of uh, like symmetric powers of the cotangent complex. And as a differential, we take the total differential. Oh, it's it just because like, let's say X would be a, a smooth algebraic variety or a smooth manifold. Uh, you want the Durham complex to be the wedge products of the, of, of one forms. So that's why you're like shifting this here. So that symmetric power of something that sits in odd degree that becomes an exterior algebra. That's, that's the main reason. Yes, but uh, but the, but the like whenever you have like a complex, the the correct I mean the the best way to define the exterior algebra is to define this it as the symmetric algebra of the shifted uh, guy. So well, that's a that's a convention, but uh, yeah, you could have take, done the, the, this the other way around. Yeah. All right, so uh, it's a cocycle there. Um, so a cocycle there, it's something that looks like. Uh, it's an infinite series. It's just like a omega zero plus omega one plus omega two, etc. And uh, if you if you look at what it means to be a cocycle, it means that uh, omega zero is closed under the internal differential. But if you take the Durham differential of omega zero, you'll like up to a sign. You'll find the internal differential of omega one. So you have like d Durham of omega zero plus d int of omega one equals zero, which means that omega zero, it's just a, it's a global form, so it's, it's closed by the internal differential, so it's a global form, and it's closed up and under the Durham differential up to some homotopy, and then you have a whole bunch of higher coherent homotopy that you can pack into saying that you have a cocycle for this uh, differential here. All right. And now that we have such a, an object, we can take the leading term, that's the underlying two form of this closed form. So being closed is like some additional information, it's additional data. Uh, and this two form gives you 
uh, a map from the tangents to a shift of the cotangents, and you want this map to be a quasi-isomorphism. So there's a lot of things that are very similar to, like if you know AKZ and you've known, and you know like Q manifold or QP manifold, the, the, the whole story is very similar to this. There's two different features. One is that being closed is no longer like a property that is satisfied on the nose. You don't want the RAM of something to be equal to zero. It is homotopic to zero. And you have like the whole bunch of coherent homotopies come into the definition. So that's the first feature. And the second feature is that often, like if you read the AKZ paper, you want like the non-degeneracy is satisfied in a strict sense. You want some map to be an isomorphism or in infinite dimension, maybe you want only some map to be injective. In this case, since we want to do everything in a homotopy invariant way, we ask the least that we can ask, it's that it's a quasi-isomorphism. So it induces an isomorphism in cohomology. So here are a few examples. So the first uh, nice example is if, if G is an affine algebraic group uh, and it's equipped, so we have a, a non-degenerate invariant two form symmetric on, on, G, on the Lie algebra. And, it's, uh, and we assume that it's non-degenerate in the sense that the pairing between uh, 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 that we get on G is non-degenerate. Then this induces uh, a two-shifted symplectic structure. On BG. Yeah, I should have said that like this whole story, at least the very big, I mean the beginning, it's due to Pantaev, Toen, Vakier, and Vizzozzi. Um, another example. Yeah, so the, the reason that, it, that it's too shifted is because the, if you compute the tangent complex to BG, so sheaves on BG are just G representations or complexes of G representation. You can compute the tangent complex of BG and that happens to be G shifted by one so that this pairing here on G has degree two, right? And the reason why the tangent to BG is G shifted by one is, is because BG is the classifying stack for G torsors. And whenever, like, well, that, that's a very standard computation, if you look at moduli of G torsors, uh, if you take a smooth point there, you compute the tangent. It's always H1 of like whatever you have with values in the adjoints. So that's exactly the reason why we have G sh shifted by one here. In this case, no. There's just a, it's it's a, it's actually a, one situation when there's no higher uh, homotopies. No, uh, actually, you you would see the current. Yeah, so like this this. Uh, yeah, no, no. In this case, you don't see it. Um, you start to see it if you. Yeah, no. Let, let me not say when, but uh, in this example, strictly speaking, we don't see it. Uh, another one is uh, if you take the dual of the Lie algebra and you mod out by the G acting in, by the coagent action, that is a one shifted symplectic. This does not require any structure like this. It is just the fact that this stack is the cotangent with a shift by one to BG. And it's a theorem that cotang shifted cotangent stack of uh, artin sacks are shifted symplectic. Um, yeah, more generally, if you have a quasi-symplectic groupoid, that will give an example of a one-shifted symplectic structure. So if uh, G1, G0, like this, is a quasi symplectic groupoid, then 
the quotient of G0 by G1, the quotient stack, is one shifted symplectic. And uh, this example uh, belongs, like, is a specific case of this one, where you take uh, G0 to be uh, G dual and G1 to be the cotangent to G. Uh, there's another example whenever G is, uh, like, whenever G is like in the first example. Uh, you can cook up a quasi-symplectic groupoid that has as arrows like G cross G and uh, an object G, and the quotient is the adjoint quotient of G by itself, and this is also one-shifted symplectic just because of the previous example here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like when the 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 the, the cosical identity is not exactly uh, satisfied, but up to the ram of something, and that's where you yeah. All right, and there's now a, also a nice class of example that comes from some AKZ type construction. So I won't give the general results. Let me give one example. So if M is a compact oriented N manifold, um, there's a there's a, a stack that in, you can construct. It's called the Betty stack of M. Let's assume M is connected. It's easier. So it's actually this Betty stack of M. It's a quotient of the points. So like M has like a one cells, two cells, etc. So the one cells are the symmetries, two cells are higher symmetries, and so on. So that's a, that's a, that's a successive quotient of points uh, by several symmetries and higher symmetries. So like in terms of stack, that's the, the, that's the stack that is, that's the constant stack equal to the homotopy type of M. Um, and now if you take maps from M Betty to BG, uh, what you get is something that is uh, 2 minus n shifted symplectic provided that on BG you put the two shifted symplectic structure that's given by this example here. And the way you do that is you, you pull back the two form on BG via the evaluation map. So like, let's pull back the form associated to uh, to this uh, pairing C, and then we use the fundamental class of M Betty to integrate out uh, the so the pullback by the evaluation leaves on M Betty cross map, and then we integrate out the part which is on M Betty, and that gives a symplectic structure on on the mapping stack. All right, um, that actually works if you replace B G by any shifted symplectic guy, then the shift here will be the, the, the degree shift of BG minus the dimension of M all, all the time, right? So that, that works for map from M Betty to any, I don't know, K shifted symplectic stack, and the formula is the same. You pull back the form on X, and then you integrate out the embedded part. Did you say what Sorry? What is embedded? again, it's a, it's a, so if, I don't know, like, depends what you're used to. So if you think about the functor of points, uh, like, it's the, it's the shiftification of the constant functor equal to like the homotopy type of M. So stacks are functors out, some, out of some like a Grothendieck topology uh, to spaces or infinity groupoid. We just take the constant functor equal to the homotopy type of M. That's not a, a stack, that's a pre-stack and we, we stackify or shiftify it and that gives a stack. Uh, if you think about it like 
any compact homotopy type can be presented as some homotopy limit of a bunch of points. And we, if you do this homotopy limit in the category of stacks, you get MBT. Sorry? Yes, MB, uh, that, that's another way. So it's, a, it's the infinity groupoids, uh, it, it's the fundamental infinity groupoid of, of M, if you want. Exactly. All right. Um, so now I want to talk about Lagrangian in, in the shifted symplectic context. And Lagrangian can be something else than sub-manifold or sub-object. Anyway, for stacks, it's, uh, it doesn't always make sense to talk about sub-things. All right, so uh, let's assume that we're, we have a, a morphism between stacks. And there are good stacks, so art in stacks. Uh, so er, like they are tractable in terms of like with derived algebraic geometry. Um, the definition is the following. So an n-shifted Lagrangian structure on F is uh, the following data. So an n-shifted symplectic structure on X and the homotopy between the pullback of omega and zero, let me call this eta, in the complex uh, the Duram, uh, yes, this, this weighted below, uh, like weighted two truncated Duram complex of L uh, so that's a homotopy like this. So let me, like, in concrete terms, what it means, it means that F star omega zero is exact. So it's the int of some eta zero. So it's a, like saying that we have a homotopy, it means that between the, this and zero, it just means that this cocycle here happens to be a co-boundary. That's, that's just a, in concrete terms, that's what it means. Uh, then for F star of omega one, it means that it's D Duram of omega zero plus D int of omega one. And then you have like all other equations like this. Okay. Yeah, other questions? Oh, sorry, that's eta on the right, thank you. <laughs> no, no, otherwise, yeah. That's the homotopy, right. And there's an additional condition that the homotopy should satisfy. Because like, if it was just homotopy to zero without any condition, that would be the definition of an isotropic guy. Now we have like this, this uh, maximality condition that should be satisfied, but that's difficult to say, like it has maximal dimension. It doesn't mean anything in, like in the derived context. Uh, the, the correct thing to say is that um, whenever we take the tangent to L, it has a map to the pullback of the tangent to X. We've already seen that the tangent to X is identified with a cotangent of X, maybe with a shift. And then there's a dual of this map here that goes to the cotangent of L still with a shift. So we have a sequence with three terms and the condition is that this sequence is a homotopy fiber sequence. So what, what does this mean? First of all, it should be, the sequence should be null homotopic, namely, the composition of these two things should be homotopic to zero. But that is exactly the first condition that we are having here. Like when we pull back the form uh, to L, it is homotopic to zero. So it tells us that this composed map is homotopic to zero, so we're on the safe side. 
because it's homotopic to zero, um, there's a map from this guy to the cocone of this morphism. And saying that it's a homotopy fiber sequence just says that this guy is quasi isomorphic to the cocone of this sequence here. All right, so it's just a, like, in another way, you could say that it means that this sequence of complexes induces a long exact sequence in core homology. That's another way to say the same thing. And indeed, I mean, the usual case of Lagrangian morphism, so if everyone is smooth, uh, is a smooth uh, manifold, let's say, and L is a submanifold of X, it's a, it's a, it's a closed submanifold, then uh, this condition boils down to saying that we have the tangent to L, it injects into the tangent to X, which is isomorphic to the cotangent, and then we have a subjection to uh, the cotangent to L, and we just want this to be a, an exact sequence. So that's how it translates whenever there's nothing derived and like everything is concentrated in degree zero. And indeed, what this means, it means that TL can be identified with the conormal bundle of L into X. And that is exactly the, like that's one of the equivalent condition defining a, a Lagrangian submanifold. All right, so uh, maybe let me give some examples. Yes? Oh, sorry. Uh, in here, yes, that, that is what is telling you that this sequence is null homotopic, so there's that this composed map is homotopic to zero. The homotopy is given by eta zero. In here, there's no room for homotopies because they're like, like everything is concentrated in degree zero. So we know that like for, for honest Lagrangian into, uh, into honest manifolds, uh, I mean, this sequence, like this compost map, is equal to zero. Yes, there was also a question. So these are complexes. So like uh, saying that it, this composed map is homotopic to zero means that like you have a, a complex of morphisms from there to there. Saying that you have a morphism, a morphism of cochain map, it means that uh, like the map here is closed in this complex. And saying that it's exact, it means that this map is homotopic to zero. Okay. So that's like this map here is represented by actually that guy here, which we know it's a, it's a cocycle for the internal differential. And the fact that it's exact is saying that this, this sequence is homotopic, like is null homotopic, so the, the composed map is homotopic to zero. And once you have a homotopy with zero, you can construct a map from this to the cocone of this morphism. That's this thing that you construct, you put this one in, like in some degree, you put that one, you shift, and now this map is part of the differential of the new complex that you construct. Saying that this is homotopic to zero, it's exactly saying that you have a map from this guy to the cocone, and the condition of being a fiber sequence is that the map to the cocone is a quasi-isomorphism. Okay? Like in this case, the cocone, because this is a subjective map, is isomorphic to the, uh, uh, to the kernel. All right, so examples of Lagrangian morphisms. Okay, so there, there are the easy examples, like typically, uh, uh, these two ones can be checked by hand. So like BG, which is the quotient of point mod G, and G dual are both Lagrangian in this coagent quotient. Um, 
Like actually, that that's something that can like there's an explicit form for the for the shifted symplectic structure here. Uh, you pull it back, you see that it's zero, and you see very well that the the tangent. I mean, this splits the the, the tangent of this in two parts. Uh, more generally, uh, the the first case is an example of this. If you have a uh, what a symplectic groupoid. Then the map from G0, so the quotient map from G0 to the quotient, is Lagrangian. That doesn't work for quasi-symplectic groupoids. So quasi-symplectic groupoid, you get that the quotient is shifted symplectic. But if your quasi-symplectic groupoid happens to be a, a symplectic groupoid, so this cosecular identity is really verified on the nose, then the quotient map itself is a Lagrangian morphism. Um, more interestingly, uh, if you have a symplectic guy with a moment map, then the map from X mod G to G dual mod G is also a Lagrangian map. So that's a reinterpretation of like a moment map as Lagrangian morphisms. And, oh, that's good. Now, uh, if you have a compact oriented N manifold, I should have said before that like it's closed, it doesn't have boundary, but if now it has a boundary, then, um, that's perfect. So the boundary is now closed, so map from the petty stack of the boundary to BG that is going to be 2 minus n minus 1, so 1 minus n shifted symplectic. It's just because the boundary has dimension n minus 1. And the restriction map to the boundary that has a Lagrangian structure. If you think of like, uh, so, like maps from M beta to BG, that's the local systems on G local systems on M. Uh, uh, it's known that G local systems on the surface, if you restrict to a smooth locus, uh, you get something which is symplectic. And if your surface is, is boarding a, a three manifold, then it's known that like, like under some restrictions, that the the subspace of those uh, g local system that extend to a g local system on the on the bulk, uh, this defines a Lagrangian submanifold. So that's the shadow of like a marginal thing. Um, maybe as a comment, let me say that uh, most example I gave are actually non-derived. These are just honest stacks. That example here. That's a derived example. So the, the, the tangent complex to the mapping stack from M beta to BG, that's the whole cohomology of M with value in the adjoint representation. Uh, so it has, a, it has zeroth cohomology in degree minus one, uh, first cohomology in degree zero, and, and so on. So you see that the tangent complex has some, something in positive degree, which means that we have derived stacks here. And if you don't allow the derived part, you have no chance to have a non-degenerate pairing. Because if you have something in degree minus one and degree zero, if you want to identify, like maybe with some shift, this with the, its cotangent, which will have like things in positive degree, you need to have something which is well balanced between the stacky and the derived part. Um, there's a nice feature of this shifted Lagrangian Oh yes, in this example, like uh, even if you started with like BG where things are um, like everything is completely strict, whenever you do this transgression procedure, like pull back by evaluation and then integration along some fundamental class, uh, you get something with a lot of uh, of homotopies. Yeah, um, like the only way you wouldn't get homotopies, I think, would be to pick up an infinite dimensional model for this, but then you would run up into problems with like dealing with infinite dimension. So that's like, so somehow this, this, this gadget is defined like 
like in a model independent way. Of course, if you pick a specific model for this mapping stack, if you pick a nice enough one, you might have everything strict. Most of the time, to get this, you would need to go to infinite dimensional things. But if you pick a random model for this, there, there will be for sure uh, higher homotopies in the, in the, in the game. Also, th there's a nice feature is that uh, this, like, because we work like in the context of derived geometry, uh, all pullbacks, namely fiber products and so on, are well defined uh, and perfectly legitimate. So the the so Weinstein's category make per makes perfect sense. So we can have we can compose Lagrangian like, correspondence. So Lagrangian like, correspondence compose well. I mean, for me, a Lagrangian correspondence, that's a, that's a Lagrangian morphism towards x cross y bar, where y bar is just y equipped with the opposite symplectic structure. And whenever you have, I don't know, L1, let me write a Lagrangian correspondence that way, then L2 from z, you just do the fiber product of those two over y. And this, this becomes automatically a Lagrangian correspondence between x and z. That's, that really follows from the, the whole formalism. But in a, an even nicer feature it's, of this is an example that I didn't give you, um, is that if you pick the point and you equip it with the n-shifted symplectic structure, which is 0, it happens to be non-degenerate on, on the point, right? So let me write point sub n for points viewed as an n-shifted symplectic stack, uh, a Lagrangian structure on this map here, this is completely equivalent to an n minus 1 shifted symplectic structure on x. That is a bit weird. <laughs> um, the reason is um, you have 0 here. Pull it back there. The Lagrangian structure, it's a homotopy between 0 and 0. So like a homotopy between 0 and 0, that's a, that's a, that's a co-boundary that co-bounds the trivial co-cycle. So that's itself a co-cycle, but of degree 1 less. And then you can, sh you can check that non-degeneracy carries on. So that's why we have something which is n minus 1 shifty symplectic on x. right? This is very cool because it has one consequence. Oh, let me write it here. This consequence is that if you have two Lagrangians in the same guy, so Lagrangian in, in, in Y, you can see them as a correspondence from point to Y or from Y to point, right? Uh, then when you intersect them, so by this I mean you take their fiber product, you get a Lagrangian correspondence between point and point, so that's a, that becomes n minus 1 shifted symplectic automatically. So whenever we do Lagrangian intersection, we get something which is minus 1 shifted symplectic. Um, it has, uh, like, there, there are nice instances of this. Actually, the, the fact that the derived critical locus is minus 1 shifted symplectic comes from this. Um, so the examples of this situation are typically you take the cotangent to some stack x, you take the graph of the differential of a, of a function, you take the zero section, both are Lagrangian, and the intersection is the derived critical locus of f, and it's minus one shifted symplectic then. Um, other examples which are pretty cool are related to symplectic reduction. So assume you have a moment map. So a moment map, you view it as a Lagrangian morphism from x mod g to g dual mod g. Well, actually you can recover the symplectic structure. So g dual mod g, that's one shifted symplectic. One can recover the symplectic structure on x from this data by just doing the intersection with this Lagrangian, which is a kind of uh, space-filling Lagrangian, that's G-dual inside this. 
and the, you can show that the fiber product is X itself. So it recovers the zero shifted symplectic structure on X. So somehow giving a Lagrangian structure already encodes the symplectic structure on X that you started with to construct your Lagrangian. Um, but there's something else you can do because there's two nice Lagrangian inside uh, this guy. There's also point mod G. And uh, the quotient is what? It's, uh, it's just the fiber product of uh, X. So it's the fiber of the moment map at zero mod out by G. So that's what you'd like to call X red. So that's the derived symplectic reduction of X for this moment map. If zero is a regular value and if G acts nicely, this guy is going to be equivalent to the usual uh, Martin-Weinstein uh, symplectic reduction. In more pathological case, I would be tempted to say that that guy is the correct one to look at um, because it, it carries some uh, shifty symplectic structure. But you see that it, it will have uh, both a stacky and a derived part. The derived part comes from the fact that zero is, might not be a regular value, so it and, and that G then doesn't, doesn't act so nicely. Okay. Um, so there's a, whenever you have a, so if I go back to the example of the, of the mapping stacks, whenever you have like two manifolds which are bordered by the same one, so like the mapping construction is compatible with, with this, uh, this composition of Lagrangian. So it means that if you have M and N that have the same boundary, uh, this gives two Lagrangian in that guy. When you do the intersection of those two Lagrangian, you recover the map out of the gluing of these two manifolds. The, hub, the, like the, the short way of saying this is that map from like whatever Betty to BG is uh, like actually it works like for boundaries, but it also works with corners. So it's, it defines a fully extended, extended TFT, uh, like in any dimension, well, oriented TFT, in any dimension. Uh, and it, it takes values in some suitable higher category of iterated Lagrangian correspondence that I'm not going to define. Um, like, you learned about fully extended TFT in, a, in this afternoon talk, I think. Um, yeah, it's related to the Cobordism hypothesis. All right. Um, now I want to uh, go to the, like the, the main object of interest I had in the very beginning. So I want to talk about shifted symplectic reduction. Or we could just say symplectic reduction for derived tri critical loci. So let me mention that all I said here, like with G dual mod G, if you shift G dual by any number, like the whole story remains exactly the same, except that instead of having like one shifted symplectic things, you might have like a two shifted or zero shifted, etc. But uh, so so this moment map business viewed as like a, this Lagrangian uh, morphism, it makes perfect sense with any kind of shift you would like to put in your moment map. So that's a, that's a cool thing about this. And um, so now it allows to, to, to state precisely what I was saying in the very beginning of the talk. So if we have like a, a function on X, uh, a group acting on X and leaving F invariant, if X is a, is a smooth manifold or a smooth algebraic variety, that's enough. If X is a, like some kind of a crazy stack, being invariant might be additional structure. It's just the data that allows to descend from X to X mod G. So that, that might be actually like, that sounds like a property, but uh, in many cases, 
it's going to be additional structure to be invariant. Uh, but it, let's keep it like this. And let me write um, f bar for the function that goes from x mod g to a1. Then the, the main result is the following. Oh, yeah, sorry. I should have said this. Actually, this sounds like a one-line statement, but that's a, that's a huge amount of work that we did with uh, uh, Rune Haugseng and Claudia Scheinbauer. And a large part of the difficulties lies in the fact that everything is like, uh, you have like higher categories in the game and like to, to, to even define the things you want to work with. But uh, yeah. Uh, now, the theorem I want to state is some joint work with uh, Mathieu Anel. It's the following. So there exists a shifted moment map from the critical locus of F. So it's a moment map with values in G dual shifted by minus one, uh, such that uh, when you compute the shifted symplectic reduction of the critical locus, what you get is the critical locus of the function that is defined on the on the quotient stack. So, like, I'm not going to prove this, but I, I want I really want to explain where these maps come, from, where these shifted moment maps comes from. And uh, it's actually a, a pretty nice and easy thing. So you have the critical locus of F, that's a derived intersection. So that's zero, that's DF. Oh. And uh, now, because X is acted on by G, you can lift this action on T star X, and this action becomes Hamiltonian, so it carries a moment map. So we, we do have a moment map to G dual here. And it's very easy to see that, uh, well, the zero section factors through zero here. And because of, of the invariance of F, the graph of, uh, the graph of DF also factors through zero. So it means that the, there's a map from the critical locus of f because of this through into the derived intersection of zero with itself into g dual. And that's a, that's a very standard calculation of homological algebra that, that it, this is actually g dual shifted by minus one. If you take the derived loop, base loop at a point in an affine space, you get the same as affine space but shifted by minus one. Um, all right. Um, there's a, so that's actually, uh, you see that it's, it, it is not something that is specific to the derived critical locus. It has to do with, uh, with Lagrangian into some symplectic guy with a moment map. So there's actually a more general statement. Yes? On T star X, the Hamiltonian action is like, it's a, it's a map from T star X like everything mod G to G dual mod G. But now what you can show is that the critical locus of F, it gets acted on by G as well, because like this whole picture is G covariance. And it gets a map, so it gets a map from this to G dual now shifted by minus one mod G. I didn't say why this map is Lagrangian, I just wanted to to give you like a reason why you get such a map here. 
Um, yes, exactly. That's, that's the zero shift cotangent of BG. Exactly, yeah. So more generally, if you have a, um, so if you have like x to g, so moment map, and you have two Lagrangian, L1 and L2, and you assume that these Lagrangians are reducible, it means that they admit symplectic reduction in the following sense, uh, like so, um, okay, so there's, there's x, that's x red, and actually, there's something that I didn't say, but, but that's, I think you're, like, everyone who's seen, like, symplectic reduction is familiar with this. Let me take the mu equals zero locus. It means, like, it's the fiber product of x with zero in, in G-dual. That's a Lagrangian correspondence between those two guys. Uh, now, I'm saying that uh, um, a Lagrangian L in X is reducible if it actually is the pullback of a Lagrangian in the reduced guy. So I'm saying it's reducible if there exists an L red such that this L is the pullback of L red along this Lagrangian correspondence. And so it defines a Lagrangian in X. Whenever you have a situation like this, it forces L red First of all, it forces L to take values like in the zeros of, of the moment map, of course, like just by definition. And it forces L red to be actually L mod G. That's, uh, I mean, that's something one can check. It's just because this guy is this guy mod G here. And by university of quotient, it has to be like this. All right. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to say now, like you can play the same game, you replace x, like the, the, the graph of df and the zero section by two Lagrangian. If they are reducible, then like the same game can be played. And what you get is that L1 cross L2 over x gets a moment map and uh, if you apply reduction to this, what you get is actually the intersection of L1 reduced with L2 reduced into X reduced as a shifted symplectic guy. Um, yes? Yes. To be what? Oh, I think it's far from being like an equivalence with what? With one of the two, uh, like being gi giving an equivalence between X red and X? Oh, I think it's really far from being an equivalence. Um, yeah. It, Though it depends, because if you iterate enough, like, you know that there's like, a, in the category of Lagrangian like correspondence, you can take correspondence of correspondence and so on. If you go to infinity, it happens that all correspondences become invertible. That's a, that, that's a very standard, I mean, that, that's like, without the Lagrangian adjective, it's a, it's a standard thing. But if you stop at some point, there's no reason anyone should be like, invertible. But there's this thing that if, if, you, if you allow yourself to take like infinitely many correspondence of correspondence, like that, that would be an infinity, infinity category, what you get is something which is actually an infinity groupoid. So if you go far enough, like to infinity, then what you say is okay, but that's, that's not specific to mu equals zero, that's, that's for everyone. Um, uh, but, uh, but if you stop at some point, I don't see any reason why this one would be an equivalence in any situation. Um, can I take like five more minutes? Is it okay? I just want to comment on a, on a kind of relative version of this. Um, and I don't know exactly like, 
like the picture is, even though it's in, in a very simple situation, uh, like how this, uh, this statement is related to the BV formalism is pretty clear to me. Now what I'm going to say is probably related to BFV, I think, but I don't know exactly in which way. Um, so here's the situation. So we have uh, X, we have a function, and assume that we have a map, let me call it pi uh, to some base, P. Um, and what I want is to look at the, uh, a critical locus with constraints or a relative critical locus. So it's constructed in the following way. So you have like T star X, T star P, and if you pull back T star P onto X, you get a map like this, and that map is a Lagrangian correspondence. Now, what we can take is take the graph of DF and pull it back via this correspondence to a Lagrangian in T star P. This guy is what I want to call the uh, constraint or relative critical locus of F with respect to the projection pi. Uh, maybe like, let me give an example that is, that is like infinite dimensional, but that's, uh, that maybe explains you why this is so, uh, why, why the, I call this constraint critical locus. If you take um, X to be path, into some space M, and you take P to be M cross M. And uh, the map pi is just uh, taking endpoints of the path, right? And for function F, I don't know, take your favorite uh, uh, action functional or whatever, I mean, uh, maybe integral over Z1, uh, assume there's a metric on M, uh, like F of gamma, of a path that would be like a two plus some potential. I don't know. I mean, it depends what you want. So maybe I assume that your function is something of that sort, right? Um, so it's in let's in yeah. And now the the relative critical locus or constraint critical locus of F that's going to live inside uh, T star of M cross M. So that's T star M cross T star M. And these are exactly the solution of the Euler-Lagrange equation with like constraints on the endpoints. So that's exactly the, the, like the trajectories of your system in, in phase space. Uh, and that, that defines the Lagrangian inside this. Okay? I don't know. That, that's a... Uh, uh, that's why I, I tend to call this critical locus with constraints. But, uh, and uh, there are also like nice example of those things to, that you can define from the like from quiver representation. But I won't do this because like there's no time. Yes. Sorry. This is always Lagrangian. Yes. It's because it's a Lagrangian pulled back along the Lagrangian correspondence, so that's, that's always Lagrangian in T star P. It might not be a sub thing, though. Uh, most of the time, it's actually not. So, like, uh, usually people put condition on pi so that you get a sub thing. Uh, I don't know, probably, at least you should ask that pi is, is a submersion or something like this. But, uh, yeah. And so the... Uh, the result is the following. So we assume now that uh, G acts on the above picture. So it acts on G, it acts on P. Pi is equivariant and F is invariant, right? So Pi is equivariant and F is invariant. I don't assume that G acts on A1. Um, all right. So. Yeah, so what it says is the following. So let me write pi bar for the map from x mod g to p mod g. And f bar is the map from x mod g to a1. And now we have the following picture. So uh, we have t star p. Uh, we have mu equals 0. 
we have the reduced space of T star P, but it, that, that's an easy check that it's actually T star of P mod G. It's designed for this. Um, and now um, we have like the relative critical locus of F with respect to pi. And when we pull it back, um, what we get, uh, did I, oh, I wrote it the exact wrong way. I'm sorry about this. Uh, okay, so, let, sorry. Um, right, so we have uh, the relative critical locus of f with respect to pi. And what the theorem says is that this is a reducible Lagrangian in T star p. So it, like, first of all, it lands in the, in the zeros of the, of the moment map. And it's, its reduction is the relative critical locus of f bar with respect to p bar, right? So that's, a, that's the analog of the absolute statement that we had before. Even though, like, like in this business, it's often that the, abs the relative case would imply the absolute case. Like, in this situation, it's, it's definitely not the case. I don't know how to deduce, like, the previous one from this one. Okay, I think I'm, I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much. I think so, yeah, but I've, I've, I haven't checked it. And I actually know too little about the BFE formalism to maybe that, that's an exercise to do, yeah. It's zero shift is symplectic, yes. Okay. Right. So the differential, you mean the BV, the BV differential? Oh, that's the, so yeah, as I said in the beginning, I, I, I was interested in the classical BV formalism. Of course, if like, if you want to perform quantization, you would have to care about. Ah, the Q differential? That's, oh, that's, that's uh, of course, that's part of the, uh, that comes with the derived structure. Yes, yes. The, the thing that you don't have with this uh, shifted symplectic picture is the BV, like the charge. So you don't know, like, it's not given from the general formalism that your differential is a bracket with, like, is, bra is like a bracket with some, something. Um, that, that's a feature that people like to have. You probably can show that it's, it's true locally. I'm not sure, like, uh, like, with these general stacks that you can show that you have a, uh, like a charge, like I don't know, I, I don't know if, the, if this is the correct term, but the fact that your differential is going is given by bracket with um, some function, um, it's not given for granted in by by the by this formalism. Sorry. Oh, it, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is Hamiltonian. Yeah. Right, yes, yes. Could you say again what this uh, example here of the fact space? This, this relative critical locus is the, is the fixed endpoint critical locus? Is that? Yes. Okay. Even though, like, that, that's a bit cheating because, like, this is infinite dimensional. And like, oh, like part of my motivation was to avoid like this. The, like for instance, I, like I started to do this shifted symplectic geometry because I wanted to, I was interested in the AKZ procedure. And I was also interested in some paper of Alberto with uh, Mnief and Rechtikin where they had this construction they, and they, they had this like remark saying that this can be probably promoted to a like 
TFT or fully extended TFT. And like, I wanted to avoid this infinite dimensional complication, and that's why I ended up doing this. So, so I'm a bit embarrassed to give this example, which is like intrinsically infinite dimensional. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, still, I think like this, like this space here. Of course, like the end result is finite dimensional, but the construction itself it starts from like I don't see what you could replace here, because usually like this with the AKZ procedure you have like infinite dimensional things, but they have a differential within it, and the and the and the like the tangent cohomology happens to be finite dimensional for like because you have like ellipticity. So it, it, it tells you that there's probably, there are a, an infinite dimensional way to present an actual finite dimensional stack. But like whenever you take path space with no more structure, you, you cannot make it finite dimensional, I think. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yes. So, and you prove that, that this is um, from the bedding stack into PG. Yeah. The way that you prove it, what are you using from the bedding stack? What are you using from PG? How general is this? Oh, so like the result is actually more general. So, like, yeah, so the, the proof goes in, like, say, let's say two steps. Um, so, there's a so you have like your favorite, uh, like infinity n category, but like a higher category of like iterated Borlism oriented. So what we first construct is a functor that goes to cospans of so-called oriented stacks. That's the Betty thing. Like if you forget about orientations, what it does, it takes like, I don't know, some coborism like this to a cospan. So that's inclusion of this into the bigger guy. And we, what we show, like there's a notion of uh, oriented stacks and relative orientations between stacks. So what we show that taking the Betty stack sends like this, this oriented coborism to cospans of oriented stacks, an iterated version of this. And then we have a functor which is map to any x where x is shifted symplectic. And this goes to some higher category of spans of Lagrangian guys. So maps reverse the arrows. But actually, you can feed this uh, map mapping construction with like other things than just Betty stacks. You could take uh, actually, you, if if you take uh, um, if you have a uh, typically a, a Calabiao proper algebraic variety smooth, uh, like you would get that the um, and you and you take x to be BG for instance, you would get that the moduli of G bundles on a Calabiao, that's uh, two minus n shifted symplectic. So if, if you're in dimension two, you, you have like modular G bundle on a K3, you recover uh, this result that says that under some condition on the smooth parts, this moduli is symplectic. There's version like with a, whenever you have like, there's an analog of having boundary for algebraic variety. It's like when you have an anti-canonical divisor, we can also recover Lagrangian map from this. So you can fit it with like a lot of things. Um, you can fit it with log the RAM stacks, which is things you've done, I think. Like, you know, this, this groupoids, uh, whenever you have a curve with a bunch of points, you define a, group, a groupoid. It has a formal version that was defined years ago by Simpson. And when you take the quotient stack, you get a log the RAM stack and it gets orientation as well. And so you get that moduli of connection with regular singularities. Some of them got shifted symplectic or Lagrangian structures. That's the target, yeah. Uh, that's iterated version of this. Um, so, 
So a definition of a fully extended TFT, it's a, it's a symmetric monoidal infinity n functor from this to some target of the same nature, like infinity. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the definition of a fully extended TFT. Okay, I'm in the middle. Yeah. But how do you work with those uh, like those things embed into here, but you have more in there. So th that's a, uh, sorry, this is, the, this category, like the objects are derived stacks equipped with like some kind of orientation. Uh, there's, a def there's a formal definition of an orientation so that I, I can give to you later. But, uh, um, and like cospan compose well, I mean, they, you just, they just like you just do push outs just like you did like pullbacks before. Oh, that, that, that's what allows you to, to, to start from like Borism to plug in Borism inside this, actually. So you could actually say that already this defines a fully extended TFT. That's a functor out of board N to something which is also a symmetric monoidal higher category. Yeah. So the board above, you have a Lagrangian map. Yeah. But both sides are just No, 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 no. No, no, only that side. This one is not because now M has boundary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I see. Yeah, so, okay, I understand your question. So there's the question like at some level you have, you take iterated span and at the next level, what do you take? Do you take morphisms between spans or equivalences, well, isomorphism between span? Like we're taking isomorphisms between spans. So that, that, that makes, life much easier because it, it, it tells you that all objects here are fully dualizable, so they all lead like almost automatically to fully extended TFTs. Um, like if you would allow the next step, like morphisms and not only isomorphism, that, that you would have an infinity n plus one category, and it would be really restrictive. It's more restrictive to have like, a, it's more difficult to construct a, a, a TFT. So probably this thing, it is not the right target for that reason, but also for another reason is that like it's not linear enough. So somehow, like when you produce TFT, you want to produce invariance, and somehow you really want the target to be somehow simpler than the source, right? Just, and it's it's not clear at all that our target is simpler than the source. I mean, come on, it's a it's a crazy thing. Like objects are like derived stacks with like correspondence between them, so you, like to. Like to do something interesting would be to quantize this picture. Um, I don't think quantizing is like composing with some functor. I think it's rather lifting to something more interesting, which is in some way more linear, where you can do computation and get numbers maybe out of it. So yeah. So for like to, for these two reasons, it's probably not the good target. Yeah. Thank you.